When I was invited to speak here today, I thought about it just for a moment speaking about assistive technologies. And the reality is that although I love technology, and if you come to my house, you'll see technology everywhere, it's not the conversation that I really wanted us to have today. We often engage in professional dialogues, focusing on things like differentiated instruction, multiple intelligences, assistive technologies, and various ways of assessing students. But while we spend a lot of this time talking, nothing seems to make substantial change in our, in our system. We still have the lockstep classroom practice that Don just spoke about. And over the last 15 years, I've struggled as a teacher with this. I've struggled because although I've been given great opportunities to integrate technology, I had one of the first smart boards in my calculus classroom in the country in 1999, I've really not been able to achieve the kind of student-centered learning environment that I really wanted to. And I just, I felt like there were too many obstacles in my way. And I boiled the problem down to this. We have an individual teacher teaching in an individual classroom to a group of children who are an individual year through individual textbooks and black line masters, which although we say they are scaffolded, they're really not. And we evaluate children on an individual basis and we distill all of this evaluation down to an individual grade. And as Dr. Shanker said, we do this in a world where social relationships are key to a child's long-term success and happiness. We also do this in a time where social networking, collective thought, collective action, and collective knowing are dominating increasingly our personal, professional, and political lives. And I think all of this individualism is what really causes all the problems in learning today. Not just for kids with different learning abilities, but for all kids. It limits those academically strong kids to a narrow scope of curriculum. It frustrates parents and children who cannot seem to get beyond the average performance level. And it demoralizes kids who can't learn without socially interacting with others. We've been talking about educational change for a long time. And in the 1980s, when I was in high school, we started talking about it in terms of 21st century learning. And 12 years into the decade, we're still talking about it. Some schools have actually gone ahead and jumped in. They've managed to introduce problem-based learning, technology, and done a variety of other things to try to change the learning paradigm. But we are still myop myopically focused on the wrong things in education. We keep trying to make the instructional practice better. We tell teachers, make PowerPoints, put in graphics, build in interactivity, use clickers, that will help. All the while, not looking at what the systemic problems really are. At the same time as we are myopically focusing on instructional practice, we are equally guilty of ignoring what's going on in the rest of the world. Cognitive sciences, neuroplasticity, electronics, gaming, and all kinds of worlds. While these in and of themselves could be an entire two or three hour keynote, they get about a minute each in my talk today. I want to make a case for a school experience that is quite different from the one that my children and I are currently having. It used to be that a teacher in a schoolhouse had all the knowledge that the classroom would need. The reality today is that knowing is not learning, and learning is so much more than knowing. Now I know many teachers and parents often say to me, it's important that kids remember stuff. It's important that they have standards and content under their belt before they get too far in education. And if you've ever been to a dinner party or a social event with me, you know that I love this argument. My husband often kicks me under the table to tell me to be quiet to stop from talking to parents and friends about it. The reality is, though, that kids can remember whatever they want, whatever is personally relevant to them. Take, for example, the world of Bulbapedia. You may not know what Bulbapedia is, especially if you don't have preteen boys living in your home. It's Pokemon and Wikipedia combined into an online environment. This website has only over 20,000 web pages of information. <laughs> I see some family from adults nodding out here. If you've ever been talking to a preteen child, they can tell you facts, figures, the evolutions of characters, how much damage they can do relative to another character's abilities. It's an amazing thing. Memory is not an issue when motivation and personal relevance are high. We do not need to worry about kids' memories. We also spend a great deal of time leveraging technology as a catalyst for change. But in fact, what we should be doing is removing all the technologies that maintain the status quo of the one-to-many teacher-to-student-centered relationship. What would happen if we removed the chalkboards from the classroom? 
How about the white words? Maybe even the smart words. And let's get rid of the textbooks and black and master when we're at it. As a textbook author, I'd happily give up the royalties. Looping is an old practice developed in the early 1900s at Waldorf schools in Germany, and it involves a group of children staying with a teacher for more than two years. The benefits of looping are clear. Long-term student-teacher relationships, no transition time, the teacher doesn't take time to learn about a child from September to mid-October. A teacher has a depth of knowledge of a child's strengths and weaknesses that they couldn't get in a 10-month period. And most importantly, looping encourages a community between parent, student, and teacher, and all of the members of that classroom. Yet it is still seen as an alternative practice. If we combine looping with team teaching in a student-centered inquiry-based program, not only does this create a, an incredible learning opportunity for children, but it does the same for professional development of teachers. To learn in the context of one's professional practice is an incredible opportunity, incredible experience. The best way for teachers to, to improve is, in fact, in line with their regular practice, where everyone in the classroom sees that knowledge is built through interaction, conversation, and dialogue, not borrowed from the teacher until the test, at which point you no longer remember. We talk about community, we talk about building communities of learners, but we rarely do it in the classroom. While student-centered teaching and team teaching and looping are critical underpinnings of what I think our new education system should be, we also need to consider a few other things. If we believe that we are responsible for teaching children and not content, then we need to also reconsider our curriculum expectations. We have over 160 curriculum expectations in kindergarten alone. I counted them. This past week, the Global Mail reported that a student earning a Bachelor of Arts, that 20% of students earning a Bachelor of Arts degrees are likely to earn less than the national average age, average wage of $37,000 per year. Taken together with the fact that we will reach 7 million people on the planet by the end of this month, a BA is no longer a differentiator. And if you consider this in the context of Chris Anderson's business model of long tail, what we really need to be doing is we really need to be developing children with special skills, niche skills. We cannot do that in the current prescriptive model of compulsory subjects in K-12 education. Executive functioning and the ability to focus and quiet one's brain are on the endangered species skill list. Our children are bombarded with digital stimulation, and in my house alone, there's probably in the neighborhood of 20 devices amongst the four kids living in my home. Physical activity, music education, and mindfulness teaching are required parts of our curriculum if we really want to help kids manage this process. Yet these are the areas that we have funding for or we simply don't engage in. In 2009, Daniel Payne spoke at a TED conference on the science of motivation. While his talk was focused on business rewards and structures implicit in business, the complex tasks that he spoke about and the need for intrinsic rewards and the sense of value play a part in our motivation system in education today. Learning is too complex a task to engage in for simple grades as the rewards. Grades which, by the way, have no currency in the lives of our children. Motivation, autonomy, and purpose are critical. Just for fun, I know it's pretty lame, but I took Daniel Pink's talk and I replaced business with the word education, and the whole talk applies to our world. I'm fortunate to have four children living in my home in grades two, three, five, and six. They span three education systems, independent, public, and Catholic. Essentially, I have a microcosm of the Ontario education system. We, my children do not have time to wait for us to get our act together. They do not have time to graduate in the same kind of K-12 education system that I graduated through 20 years ago. We need for all systems of education to stop worrying about curriculum coverage and content. We, need, we want all learners to love learning. We need to get with the program and get on with building communities. Now, I hope you've understood from my talk that this is not a talk that is all about me. It's not my individual thoughts. It's a collection of information from my community of learners. And I hope you take that as part and parcel of the information and the message I'm sending today. Thank you.